Welcome to the show. Do you ride a motorcycle? Does loved one ride a motorcycle? Do you wish you owned a motorcycle? Have you ever been in a motorcycle crash or know someone that's had a serious injury on a motorcycle? We're getting into all of it tonight. We're talking about head trauma and motorcycle injuries, specifically helmets, uh, what happens in third world countries where helmets really aren't a thing. We're going to talk about it all, so stay with us. We'll be right back. And we're live. All right, another week of the Red and Nordy Show where we're getting into all things brain and spine. Josh, what's cooking on your end this week? I'm going to uh, go ahead and just do a quick quality check, make sure we're live on all our channels. Perfect. I'm a little under the weather, so if you can't hear me, yell at me to, to speak up, but I'm drinking some tea. I'm happy to be here and right. excited to talk about another thing Like I, I am somewhat passionate about, right? Like. I used to I used to ride a motorcycle. Um, it's one of my favorite things in the world to do. There's nothing like being on the open road, you and the bike, no distractions, just cruising and and enjoying it. And something to consider when riding a bike is is your head protection. Um, so I'm excited to get into it and hear hear your thoughts on it. I was reading through some of the articles that that you provided just to to get their takes on helmet safety. And things of that nature, but I'm I'm excited to get into it. You were reading the articles that I put in the Google Drive. Yeah. Oh, fascinating! I didn't most prepared I've ever been. There. Yeah. I put those in there more for myself. So the fact that you saw them even better. Peeking around, peeking around, just like, getting, right. getting my that. Juices Not like Dr. Nordy getting into the <clears throat> scientific literature like a professional. And so, I'd like to be very clear when I say I read, I did skim the headlines. So. Well, that's reasonable. I think that's very reasonable. Well, I'm enjoying myself a nice cup of tea this evening as we uh, get into this discussion on uh, motorcycle head injury. I mean, I think the crazy thing is I have so many interesting thoughts because it's not something I th I've, I can honestly say I've put a whole lot of thought into prior to, um, you know, this topic of discussion. I mean, that's one of the great parts of having these discussions every week. They're discussions on topics I don't live and think and, you know, dwell on regularly. So it's an opportunity to kind of expand my horizons academically a little bit. And I think I've got some pretty interesting takes on motorcycle helmets. I don't want to just throw them right out there into the abyss. I want to get into some of the meat of the discussion, but I think I've got an interesting take on this uh, I'll share with, with everyone in a little bit that uh, might change your mind how you think about motorcycle safety. So how long ago has it been since you've owned a motorcycle, Josh? It's been at least a few years. I want to say I got rid of it in like 2018. Oh, so fairly recent. So it's fairly recent, but I, I, I loved being on a motorcycle. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a very great activity for somebody who loves to drive and just, enjoys the open road gotcha carlos welcome to the show thanks for saying what's up in the chat if you're out there give us a thumbs up tell us if you ride a motorcycle let us know in the chat if you ride a motorcycle yeah, well um, and i think the most interesting thing about this topic is I, I feel like almost everyone out there probably has somebody in their family or knows somebody who rides a motorcycle at least here in the states like even if you've never ridden one you probably know somebody or have somebody in your family that rides a motorcycle one of my uncles was a big big biker like tattooed short stocky guy long beard like traditional biker in my family and i've i loved him ever since i was a kid just the idea of motorcycles was he uh was he a cruiser or was he uh i assume he, you don't you didn't describe him like a, a crotch rocket kind of guy no no he was not a, a crotch rocket man he was a he was a cruiser a sportster not a sportster my that's not the right term what's the i'm blanking on the big the big harley there's like the the touring oh. ones. He may have had a sports store to be like honest. The ones that have like radios in in the yeah. Dashboard. He's he's ever since I was a little kid, he always had Harleys, and I've always loved that style of motorcycle. That's what I had. I had a, an eight eighty three Sportster. So not a big engine, but it was a little small. Looking looking back on it, it was a little a little small for for even me, and I'm not a big guy, uh, but I, I still loved it. I loved loved riding it. Yeah, I rode a motorcycle for a very brief period of time maybe 2011 to 
14 back and like at the latest not long for me it was the type of thing yeah kind of like the social bug bit me a little bit bunch of my buddies when we got back from afghanistan all went out and bought motorcycles because they were cheaper than cars and they were single guys and then i start hearing oh we're all going out riding and i was like i just you know had a truck and a wife because i wasn't single at the time and i was like yeah you know what i'll go out and buy a motorcycle and i you know, went out and bought oh gosh i think it was for like two thousand dollars was uh like an 87 or like an 88 yamaha fzr something or other like that. <laughs> i just know everyone used to call it the fizzer <laughs> so, and, i mean i beat the crap out of that thing that's and, a perfect bike too to beat the crap out of it oh yeah hey you know that's how i can learn to tool around and then finally i i went out and bought a newer bike i think maybe a year or two old uh it was a triumph okay daytona 675 and i went from this you know 80s kind of you know it, it, had, it was a sport bike it had power but i mean this brand new triumph man oh my goodness i i could not i was not prepared for that kind of horsepower let me tell you that's was, that's what that scared me yeah. haul and it was a guy with my lack of inhibitions that is not a good that's not a good mixture it didn't take me long to realize i'm gonna kill myself if i keep this thing well and that's that's what scared me uh get a little bit of echo on your end i don't know if it's just me uh, i'm echoing or you're echoing i'm echoing on you in your stream, in your house. I'm in your house echoing. I think it's good now. I don't can you still so. hear me? I'm fine on my end. I can move all my right. mic a little bit. Maybe it's a little close to my speakers. That's all right. I'm, I'll be all right. Um, that was what scared me about a bike. I, I took a, a a motorcycle class to get my license here in mm -hmm. Illinois. Yeah, we had to do the same thing. Shout out to, to that course. It was awesome. I think everybody who drives any vehicle should have to take it. And it's free. You donate like 15 or 20 bucks. It's put on by the state. Wow, Fantastic. Free. I and mean, was, ours was free too, but... I think only because it was on the, it was like the military required it. Yeah, I know. But for I know civilians certain, to take it, I don't think yeah. it was free. So this this was free. It was put on by the state, and it was it was a blast. But we got to learn on a little like two hundred cc Honda, just whip oh, around really? on that thing. Like you're not scared at all, and it was just great. It was, and I thought it was great just to consider things on the road that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Um, and then I was getting my own bike, and I got. An 883 Harley Sportster, I think is what it was. And I was worried about how fast it was. My buddy had a 1200 cc. He's like, try it. I was like, yeah, the clutch is, is touchy, scares me a little bit. I like to go fast. I don't want to kill myself. So I was like, I'll go down a step and get an 883, still way bigger than the, the Honda. Uh, but the bike itself was just a little small. Uh, but it was still great. It was, it was fantastic. Um, but then I always had dreams of getting a bigger cruiser, you know, probably similar to your Triumph. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe one day I'm still not going to rule it out. Yeah, I think I've pretty much ruled that out in my life. I mean, maybe when I'm like way older, I could get see myself getting get a cruiser big again. Beard, get a cruiser. Uh, I don't think there'll ever be a period of my life where I'll have a big beard. I think I'll be a clean shaven man probably till the day that I die. I'll probably shave my face on the day that I die. But, uh, yeah. Did you ever get into a motorcycle wreck? No, I just, I dumped my bike a couple times, like not ready to like hold the weight when I was first doing it. So just tip it over and I was fine, but uh, never got in, never got into a wreck, never had any close calls. Uh, very fortunate on that one. So, you know, count my blessings yeah. where I can get them. I never got into anything bad. One time I took a turn real wide and uh, it was like a left-hand turn at like a T-shaped intersection, right? So yeah. I'm like coming, making a left and there's no like four-way intersection, right? It's just like a flat, you know, road. And I just took it wide and kind of like hit the curb basically as I was coming left and just kind of like dump my bike off the side of the road i was fine pretty low speed it was enough to put my bike in the shop though so that kind of you know laid that up for a little bit and then i think one time i had like this close call i don't know what it, i don't even know i to this day still don't even know exactly how it happened i was uh 
coming through an intersection, I think at a, a red light. And as I'm accelerating through the intersection, my uh, back tire just kind of like fishtails out a little bit. And I, I don't know if I like slid on some like ice or something. It was like early spring. Mm -hmm. It was like one of the first times I took my bike out since the weather started getting a little bit nicer uh, in the Northeast. And it was not long after that. I was like, you know what? This bike is going to kill me. You know, I had professional ambitions. I wanted to actually like make it to the other end of my education. So yeah, I just ditched it. Well, I think that's the, this is where I definitely want to get your take on motorcycle helmet safety and all those things. Cause that was the, the biggest thing that was put into my head. And like, I quickly realized you have to be way more attentive to other things on the road that you may not have thought about before, right? Like paint gets slick in the spring not used to it that can make you you know tail out you know you have to yeah. be more cognizant of, of other cars because like you could be the best driver in the world but now you're on two wheels no bubble around you you got it you got to be careful and yeah. those type of things become a factor and i'll never forget in what i think it was either the motorcycle safety course or my buddy showed me something online because he was the one who was like yeah you should get a bike now's the time to do it it's always one buddy who does that yeah and oh yeah he showed me like there was like people talking about helmets and like they would get hit with debris coming off of trucks and you know you see their face shield dented in or scuffed up but like their head's still intact right and i think that's the important thing um so i am a proponent of helmets face face shield helmets well should we get into a heated debate about helmets not that i think there's really much to debate because you are right um but interestingly, the to kind of summarize some of the research mm -hmm. that I was reading up on today, that kind of surprised me. I, I want um, to cut you off because I do. I have some takes. If, if there's research contradicting what I just said, I do have some takes on that as well that I think other people should consider. But sorry to cut you off. Continue. No, no, no. Well, what is it? Let's hear it. The big thing. So people don't think about this is – you know, you could have all the the helmet protection in the world, but if you're not wearing leathers or protective gear on the rest of your body, uh, road rash and infections that stems from road rash could be just as deadly as if you weren't wearing helmet protection. I think that's a big part, <laughs> okay. too. Yeah. I got a good story for you. I remember when I was in high school, I got like real bad turf burn like on my hip. I think playing soccer or something like that. And it, something... It's one of those like very superficial abrasion, but some like nasty turf bacteria must have got in there. I remember like two days later, it just kind of like looked gross. And I go to like the lacrosse coach. I was like, hey, coach, uh, I think I got to go to the doctor. He's like, what for? And I like, you know, lift my shirt up. He was like, oh my gosh, get away from me. You got like staff or something. <laughs> Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, imagine if that was covering like a, a large portion of your body. Like that's yeah. gnarly stuff. No, it is. And you know, you're right. I think the takeaway, at least my perception, was sort of with the research articles we looked at, or I was looking at. Which I mean, for the audience, I can pull them up real quick. You can see what we're talking about. Um, let me just pull them up over here real quick. Zoom out on this. Screen share. All right. So this was one article. Um, and the other one was this one. I don't know. I'm not sure what the impact factor is of this journal. Seems a little suspect. What is it? Journal of Forensic Biomechanics. Let's see. I'm guessing what's the scale? I'm guessing it's a 2.4. 2.4? 2 .4? I mean, I'd be satisfied with a 2.4. Let's see. Impact factor, 4.2. Okay. We got that's, a winner. We got a winner. I mean, okay, it's fine. I mean, uh, that's probably acceptable quality in my eyes. Anyway, um, so the, I'm, I'm not going to go through these articles in detail. I just kind of wanted to pull them up. That way we're not talking about them in a vacuum. People kind of understand what we're talking about. Um, but 
basically, I think they confirm, right? Personal protective equipment, PPE, is effective for pretty much all your external injuries. What's not as clear is, and possibly, I'm going to say possibly, it's because we don't really don't know, the make of helmets as they stand right now with what are the two it's a do uh, dot and uh i don't remember the other one i know i think you have the something with it with an s i don't remember that one i think it referenced in one of the articles the dot certified is everything was ever referenced in all the safety stuff i had to take yeah uh it's referenced in one of the articles well this is you know, right. yeah. Well, the other part too is head protection is only going to get you so far. There's still other brain or traumatic injuries that can happen, even if you're wearing a helmet, right? Like some of the things we've discussed. Well, like of velocity, course. velocity related. Is that what they're called, right? Velocity. Uh, acceleration. Acceleration. Or well, rotation velocity or sounds way cooler. You should change that. Uh, but okay. you know, just let them know. Let them know at the Brain Institutes. Where is. Why can I not find this anywhere in here? It's DOT and anybody in chat know what the other? I feel like Carlos has got to know. It seems like something he'd be. Safety. I mean, it's literally in one of these articles. I just can't yeah. find it. But I guess that was to my point is, you know, even if it's up to a dot certification, I think there's even varying degrees of that, like the levels involved of a, a dot certified helmet. Is that really going to stop all of the Snells. Okay. The Snell, I think the Snell standard is a little more rigid than DOT, if I'm not mistaken. Snell certified, I think, or Snellin certified. Sounds right. Something like that. Anyway, that's what it's called. Um, The thing I found really interesting is that while basically it seems like what we external injuries, right? PPE is effective for external injuries, face, head, neck, but brain, which is like internal, basically the isn't as there it's there isn't as good of an evidence that helmets are actually reducing uh, traumatic brain injury. So I guess that's what I was kind of getting at with acceleration levels. Like your brain's still rattling around or getting going through some type of of trauma, even if you get hit in the head driving at the speeds motorcycles typically go in the US. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's it. So there's a lot of things to think about here, right? It's there's the there's the effects in the US where we ride very big, fast motorcycles. Right, you've got because I also, you know, was looking at some information from Pakistan, where they have more motorcycle drivers. They've got more unlicensed motorcycle drivers, many of which are underage adolescents. And if you've ever been to a developing country, they'll stack three, four, five people. Oh yeah. Motorcycle. They'll have infants on the back. Of you always bike. see like the the videos going around where it's like, yeah, three, four people on a bike, like carrying a bunch of stuff, like just getting around. Yeah. And it's, but they're not going as fast. Right. You know, that being said, the data is the data. There's significantly more uh, motorcycle related head trauma in these uh, low middle income countries where motorcycle regulations are relevant. And more, it's actually what I didn't realize is actually a significant economic factor. It's significantly cheaper to acquire and drive one of these little motorcycles in these countries as uh, compared to uh, an, a four-wheeled vehicle. And it's their ability to get back and forth to a job to provide for their family. And so that's why they are so much more willing to neglect safety in favor of providing. Like, what, what do you care about head trauma if you're going to starve to death, right? right. That's, the, that's the situation that... You know, motorcycle head trauma is up against in these other countries. Here in the United States, people who ride motorcycles is for, like enjoyment. You know? Yeah, very, very few a hobby. People, very, very few people, I'm sure, ride a motorcycle out of financial necessity in the United States or economic savings. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a few do. 
right? I'm sure there are some out there, but by and large, they're probably a, such a small fraction of the population that they virtually don't exist. So, but in Pakistan, where world this World Neurosurgery article um, it was publishing their data from, they basically, you know, that, that's the whole reason people ride motorcycles. People don't really ride motorcycles for leisure there. Right. So, and so this study was showing, was it, walk me through the details of it. So what, what's it talking about? Traumatic brain injuries? The, the study from Pakistan? Yeah. So basically what they wanted to know was um, they wanted to specifically look at underage use of okay. motorcycles because. Trying I mean, to put more regulations on like yeah, licensing I mean, or. I thought they put this really nice picture in there where they're like, here's a picture of an entire family. You've got like the three-year-old up front. Yep. You've got the adolescent male, probably, I don't know, 12, 13 driving. You've got the seven, eight, six, seven, eight year old kid up here. You've got the six, seven, eight year old girl behind him. You've got like the mother or older sister all the way on the back. And it's like, and not a single person wearing a helmet. Yeah. And you know, the, the thing is culturally they're very different, right? I mean, this kid may need to drive the motorcycle because he's the breadwinner for the family. I mean, who knows? These are not issues we face in the United States. And for that reason, I mean, their overall trauma numbers seem pretty impressive. They go into uh, kind of like the density of the trauma referrals to their like urban medical care system and it seems pretty intense i won't lie like they've got like pretty pretty high volume like dense volume dense volume yeah was, i mean even if that bike doesn't go that fast i mean i don't know what their roadways are like there either because oh, cars can congested. cars can still be going a good speed you know, oh yeah so. yeah well i mean and that's what that's a, another component of the data 75 percent of motorcycle collisions were with a four-wheeled vehicle i think the other 25 percent by and large this is like the epidemiologic data the other 25 percent is like single motorcycle accidents yeah um and the 75 that are accidents with other vehicles in general i think like a very high proportion of them is basically the four-wheeled vehicle not seeing and yielding to the motorcyclists um, right away. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I was talking about earlier. It's just to be cognizant of everything. Like you have to assume people can't yeah. see you. And that's another reason why like, I just like the fun of riding a motorcycle diminished very quickly for me because I felt like it was so high stress, constantly paying attention to everything. Like when I get in my car, I wanted to just like get my truck and just kind of, cruise down yeah. the road and not really have to think about like i don't know am i just gonna like fall over yeah i don't well, know it, it, i mean i'll be honest with you i'm gonna equate i'd love to line up that study versus um like a heavily populated metro area with bicycles so i live in the city of chicago mm. i see people on bikes all the time and those people half the time they don't adhere to the, the rules of the road. And it's like, you're a moving vehicle. Like you're going to get hit by somebody not paying attention. Like yeah. that stresses me out. Bikers I mean, in the city stress me out more than ever being on a motorcycle. Did. I can tell you, you mean as much. a driver, just like, just thinking about like riding a bike in the city. Like I'm always looking out for bikers. Cause again, they, they don't pay attention, but like so many people don't. So like I see them driving and some are like on their phone and like, kind of veering yeah. over out of the bike lane. I'm like, what are you doing? Stop it. You know, so I would love to line up a study like that. Um, I mean, versus I have not been to, study. I haven't been yeah. to Chicago since 1996. And I have very little recollection of what it's like there. But I did live in Manhattan, not it's probably similar that distantly. Yeah. I mean, there's bikes everywhere. Yeah. I don't, you couldn't pay me enough money to ride a bike in Manhattan. You couldn't pay me no enough to drive a car in Manhattan oh, yeah. after after visiting there for work. Like, you couldn't convince me to drive a car there every day. Like a car is actually not stressful. I, I not stressful, I but it's just 
those things are oh, like those the streets neck, yeah. are are congested. I couldn't even imagine being on a bike with it's all pain, the people. But it's not. Yeah. I don't know. To me, it's not stressful unless you're like trying to get somewhere in a yeah. certain amount of time, and you're like, I'm late, and you're stuck in traffic. There's nothing you can do about it. Otherwise, it just is what it is. It's not like I. Some people they're like, I wouldn't drive in Manhattan, and it's like, ah, whatever. I mean, that's not stressful. You couldn't pay me to get on a bike in Manhattan. No way, Jose. Those people are crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, even like, you know, doctors would, you know, take a bike to work very commonly in New York City, right? Doctors that work in New York City ride their bike to the hospital, right? I had this, um, uh, I guess you'd call them a mentor. Not, I mean, they were a significant they played a significant role in me going to medical school where I went to medical school, but that's kind of where the relationship ended. Well, this person ended up like in their, I don't know. It must've been like late thirties, early forties, maybe literally like broken hip and everything because they got hit by a car riding their bike to the hospital. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Especially if you're a surgeon. I mean, you could lose your whole career over something like that now you can say the same thing oh you get into a car accident oh yeah it's just the, the you're odds not gonna convince out. me that the odds are the same <laughs> no there's no, there's no chance like yeah i listen i understand i could walk down the stairs trip and fall fall out of a window spontaneously combust into fire like all of that could happen but the odds go down of getting into a, a serious motor vehicle accident when you have four wheels and safety features surrounding your entire body yeah. Like that's the reality of it. Plain and simple, I like driving a car. Well, I like driving. I like driving my pickup truck. I still drive it. I love driving when, anything with the wheels. When it's yeah. cold, I can turn my heated seats on. My windows defrost. Like yeah, I the it's beyond me. People who ride their bikes like to the hospital in New York City in like middle of January. It's like frozen okay. outside, and you're biking at four a.m. in the morning to the hospital. That's, like that's gonna be a pass for you. Who does that? That's the same. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of people who do those, it, obviously. But. Those are the people that their brains need to be studied because that's a different level of, of dedication those to that crime. Are, those people are a flavor of New York I will never understand. And like, I'm like you. I, well, you've lived in a warmer climate uh, for longer than I have, but I grew up in the Midwest. I still hate the cold. I hate oh, it. Yeah. And I'll never get over it. It gets I worse with I, age. The cold never bothered me as. Well, it it's the like, wind. It's the never wind really me. bothered me at like growing up in the Northeast. It was once I left, lived in San Diego for about four years, five years, or however long I was there, about four years. It was once that, once I did that, and then came back to the Northeast. It was like my whole body never recovered. I was like I lost any sort of ability to tolerate the north cold of the northeast and it just never came back now i, I like when i lived in new york the bet the, this is the one not positive thing i'll say about living in manhattan when i lived on the 15th floor and my apartment in the middle of the winter would be like 90 plus loved it loved it yeah i mean i just man i i can't stand the cold weather and that's like people being on bikes or even my buddy would ride his motorcycle and like put gloves on and like, I'm like, dude, th this stuff just cuts through me. Like I'm not built for the wind. I don't like it. It's terrible. And being on anything with wheels with no surrounding or heated seats at this point in my life, like I'm good. It's going to be a pass. Yep. Definitely. Definitely a pass for me. Hey, welcome to the chat, Mustafa. Nice to see you. We appreciate you being here with us. We're talking about motorcycle head trauma today. Obviously we're kind of getting a little derailed. Um, I am a physician. I'm joined by my co-host here, Josh. We call him not a Dr. Nordy. Uh, he brings more of the uh, down to earth perspective on things. And I bring more of the clinical perspective of things. I've trained in neurosurgery, although I did not finish my residency training. I took a brief period of time away, uh, in order to focus on raising my children. Uh, I do anticipate going back at one point in my career but for right now i'm uh primarily doing research uh community service with brain and spine patients uh in the new jersey 
community. And uh, we do the live stream to promote awareness and discussion around brain and spine injury that affects veterans. So that's kind of who I am and who Josh is. Um, you know, so everything we do is in support of a nonprofit organization, Brain and Spine Group. Uh, and the nonprofit organization is all about improving brain and spine health around the world. And, uh, you know, brings together physicians, non-physicians, anybody committed to it. So uh, thank you for, you know, that's who we are and what we do. Thanks for, uh, you know, coming and joining the show, Mustafa. Really be, nice to meet you. Where are you from, Mustafa? Let us know in the chat. Do you ride a motorcycle? Yeah. Appreciate you stopping by. Yeah. For sure. And, and joining the, the conversation here. And I mean, this, that's another thing I'd like to get your take on being, being a physician, a physician and working in hospitals in, in neurotrauma, neurosurgery, how many injuries would you see that were motorcycle related? So, or even vehicle related at that point, let's open it up. Vehicle related. Um, so this, it makes a big difference, especially like where I was training in New Jersey. It would make a big difference where, like which hospital you were at. Mm -hmm. When I was in Newark, um, you would have a not insignificant number of motorcycle or not motorcycle, uh, motor vehicle collisions. Uh, you know, I can think of a late 20s year old uh, female was out with two or three friends. I don't know. Maybe they were on their way to a party or something. They got into a car accident. I think she was in the back seat, wasn't wearing a seat belt. And she ended up with a like cervical spine, uh, a jump facet. And clinically she looked okay. She just had a little bit of weakness in her triceps. Uh, on, I think okay. on her right side. So very minimal, but the type of thing where it's like, well, you know, when you look at the imaging, you look at somebody who has a slight neurologic deficit and you go, well, you know, she's unstable and that could definitely get worse. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we did surgery on her from just a simple motor vehicle accident to stabilize her cervical spine. Um, whereas if you go down to it's more the suburban areas... Those hospitals have a lot more motor vehicle and motorcycle collisions. Whereas like the Newark, Newark is, you know, kind of just like a mini Manhattan. Oh, well, not even mini Manhattan. It's, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a city. I mean, it's not yeah. nearly, it's a big city. Honestly, we think of it as a small city because it's right across the Hudson from, uh, New York. So we think, I don't know. So you think suburb when it's really, it's still its own city. And it's it's own a place. giant city. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, and you know, it's got, it's low socioeconomic status, tons of gang uh, activity. I mean, the FBI has a headquarters in Newark um, and a headquarters in Manhattan. So you can do the math in terms of like, why if the FBI is a headquarters in Newark, there's a pretty significant, number of gang violence going on there that's being investigated at all times by the fbi um and so that's what you would see tons of that stuff right young kids gunshot wounds crazy stuff happen knifing there's that kind of stuff in new york then you go out to the suburbs and that's where you see like you know more of the frequent car really bad car accidents and which and makes sense cycle accidents and i remember pretty early on in my training uh i had a there was a guy that came in uh, motorcycle accident. Um, basically we did what we could, but it was not, uh, you know, an optimistic situation from the get go. You know, I put an ICP monitor in him. It was, you know, I remember this cause it was one of the first kind of procedural things I was learning. I was so early on in my training at that time that, uh, but um, you know, I just remember it was one of those procedures where it was like, you know, you're this brand new intern, you're, you know, excited to be doing a procedure, but you're kind of doing it on somebody that you're pretty sure is not going to make it anyway. And so it has this very like empty feeling when you're done. But when you have these really bad traumas, you kind of have to, in some ways, tell, you know, be realistic with the family, but sometimes families, they want to be really aggressive. And, you know, so Understand that, that was kind of the situation yeah. here. Well, but, you know, the same thing. It was an older guy. 
probably 60s, 70s. He was just out for a cruise on his cruiser. Got into a motorcycle accident. He was wearing a helmet. Basically progressed to brain death within 24, 48 hours. Well, that's that's the reality of, of riding a motorcycle. Yeah. That could happen. And well, that's what I want to talk about. You mentioned the other, the, the spinal cord injury. I want to take a half step back and understand exactly what that injury was that was causing that. Um, Cause you, you mentioned it you said it's something where she had some, I'm guessing it was some type of compression from her spine or you had to stabilize it compression or something uh, else. So in her case, she had a jump facet joint. So what's that? And so the facet joints are the basically different levels of vertebral bones in your spine, right? Mm -hmm. You can, envision yep. different vertebra stacked yep. on top of each other. Well, those vertebra need to connect, right? They don't just yep. sit on top of each other and slide around like this, right? If you think about it, right? If you had bones sliding around like this on top of each other and your spinal cord's running through the middle and the bones go like this, it's going to shear the spinal cord, right? So you need, there's joints that kind of lock the, you know, vertebra of the spine together allows them to move and rotate a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. to some degree of freedom, depending on where in the spine it is. Right. But it can't just, you know, kind of. Right. Can't do its own thing. It's all it's move wherever it wants. You don't have complete mobility. Mm -hmm. Right. And so these joints, they sort of kind of <laughs> overlap each other. Right. They kind of do like, um, you know, I guess what's the best way, best kind of angle to portray this, I guess maybe this. It's going to sit like, on top of each other kind of like they kind of do like something like, like kind of like interlock well it's sort of like a like a hook it's sort of yeah it's like they kind of like hook like this a little bit mm -hmm. right and then what happens is when you get like a whiplash injury they can basically they stretch and extend enough where they kind of they one gets perched on top of the other and instead of being nestled into the joint of the facet like it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. you basically kind of get them overlapped in this weird sort of way okay. where now the joint is unstable, right? And the bones will start moving. So the way that you fix that is you have to literally stretch the spine up and pull the joint back under. And so in this case, with this patient, right, we did it all in the operating room. We, uh, this is where are the medieval torture device, right? Pins in the head, like uh, under anesthesia, right? The patient can't mm -hmm. feel anything in this case, which is good. You paralyze the patient, put them under anesthesia, right? All these muscles in the neck, right? You want them relaxed and paralyzed. Mm -hmm. You don't want them tight when you're doing something like this. Put pins in the head, right? And then you put a big x ray machine around the patient, and you can literally take x rays as you pull back on their head or pull up right you're like putting traction on the head stretching the head up to get the bones to stretch apart and you're watching the bones move under x-ray and then you basically kind of you know put them in a little bit of extension and then relax the head back and hope that you see the bones go from being you know in this case perched to stretched and back into the position you want them. so is this like a non-invasive procedure like well that's like part of it is, right okay. once once you get the bones okay. realigned right mm -hmm. now all your ligaments and everything all that soft tissue probably tore yeah right so even though the bones are back in position they might not stay there so that's when once you realign the patient you put them in traction and you reduce the patient right reducing that jump mm -hmm. joint right. or reducing it back into position once you've done that then you sterilize, prep, drape, and actually do the surgery to go in and zip, 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 put screws and rods in and fuse okay. the patient's spine so that it can't do that again. Got it. Yeah. And, and, and what, what's the what's the the issue with those bones being out? Because you, you mentioned the numbness in, in her triceps or weakness in her triceps. So was something pushing on a nerve, or was it just the spine moving around and creating pressure? Uh, in her case, no uh, pro uh, she probably had uh, it was compression of the nerve root that was coming out of her spinal cord. Got it. Right. See, like this is the stuff like it's fascinating because I would have never thought about the first part. 
I never yeah. thought you had to go in and like how you clean those up. Like that makes sense from the get go, but I would have never understood the first part or even thought about it or considered yeah. it. And it's fascinating. I mean, you know, it's yeah. part of clinical training, right? And there's still so much to it that I don't know. Like I said, I mean, I, I still have tons of yeah. training to hopefully and, one day. Uh, and, where you know, was? Finish, but for now, I'm kind of running off of what I know and what I've yeah. been taught. And I still think it's, it's more insight than I ever get knowledge to. So that's why I think I find it so fascinating is, again, this is stuff I don't have exposure to. And even you mentioned you don't have all of the answers or all of the exposure, but you certainly have more than than the average person, in my opinion. And I, yeah. I like getting your input on that. I think there's a lot you pick up in a very short period of time, but then it also kind of opens your eyes to how much more there is to know that you don't. Right. And in many ways, right, that's where the enthusiasm comes from. Right. What's our motto on this show? We're not experts. We're enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I don't sounds think like we're my, going, sounds like we're going. Yeah, I don't think my 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 passion or enthusiasm <laughs> is any less. Right. Mm. I could, well, the only thing I can say for certain that's different now than a, a year or two ago is. Being a dad. Is probably the craziest thing that ever happened to you, right? You think like, oh my gosh, I'm drilling into someone's brain. I'm putting drains through holes into people's brain. I mean, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. It's a lot of fun. But it is not more fun than watching your 16-month-old whip down a slide for the first time in her life and just have pure joy on her face. Mm -hmm. I, there's no, I would never want to miss that for brain surgery. So that's why we're here doing what we're doing today. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about we took it. A, we took a, we took a leash at a Chick-fil-A last night and uh, it started <laughs> out, she's like very tentative. Didn't want to like, we took it because they have like a little play area there, like a little McDonald's play area in the Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. At first she's like really, really tentative and get her to kind of like climb up the jungle gym a little bit. And then she's like, okay, I'll go up with you. And then she's like, goes up to this, goes down this big tunnel tube slide. And like, you go down in front of her. So she kind of goes down a little bit slow. Fast forward like three, four more times. She's running up the jungle gym and flying down the slide on her own. And she's. I was going to say, is she an explorer or is she, does she stay timid for new situations? Oh, no. As soon as she figures it out, it's like. No fear. I mean, I was literally getting to a point where I was like worried she was going to like throw herself down the slide and not realize like just how like fast she's going if she's not sitting. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've never seen a kid's face just like light up like hers did when she went flying down the slide for the first time. I'm telling you, man, being a dad is it's better than brain surgery. Oh, good stuff. Anyways, yeah, so um, yeah, the, the interesting thing coming back to the main point, mm -hmm. I guess I should make my main point takeaway now. Mm -hmm. In reading some of this research on motorcycle helmets, I am not convinced they will do anything more than reduce external injuries. I think the data potentially indicates terms of like le lethality like likelihood of getting on a motorcycle and dying is probably not much lower whether or not you're wearing a helmet interesting like you may you'll sustain less you're more likely to sustain less injuries right you're going to be protected from the facial injuries the neck injuries the body yeah. injuries if you're wearing <clears throat> protective equipment but by and large, the likelihood of you getting in, if you get into a severe accident, dying versus not dying is seemingly not actually even like helmets don't actually really make a difference. Like if you get into a bad enough accident to kill you, it's going to kill you whether you're wearing a helmet or not. Interesting. I don't think there's enough evidence to say that there's really a significant difference between that accident that kills you without a helmet on not killing you if you have a helmet on right and i think it do i think it do i think it do make sense i think it does make I think sense it do make sense <laughs> i think it do make sense Nerd, 
really? I think hard in there. <laughs> in my, from what you just laid out, um, that makes sense to me, right? Like, and especially the majority of motorcycle accidents are probably either a severe one vehicle accident where they go off the road, something bad mm-hmm. happens, thrown from the vehicle, or they're getting hit by another vehicle or crashing into a vehicle, getting thrown from the motorcycle. And how much is a helmet really going to help in those situations when you're being thrust somewhere into the abyss? Um, what I do think it will help with is, again, that debris, the stuff flying off where it's it's yeah. mashing. Like, I think that's where it's like, that's one less thing that you want to be thinking about. Like you mentioned all the other dangers. Like yeah. if you're going to, if you're going to get on a motorcycle, you're going to going to go ride around. I still believe you should wear a helmet just in case a brick, a rock comes flying at your eyeball. And you know, Oh, for sure. And that's where for I think sure. it really I mean, plays. I don't the even know how point. people, I don't even know how people ride without, cause you, you know, you can like flip your visor up. I don't mm-hmm. even know how people would do that. I would try to do that. I'm like, I can't see. My eyes are watering. Yeah. I would like, crack mine to let some air in. Um, but that was about Yeah, it. maybe occasionally crack like, it. Mine, mine had vents, but yeah, I agree. And I even with like a shield and stuff, like I still just don't, like I couldn't ride like that. It's hard enough to without even having gloves on, you know, sometimes. Yeah, so. I mean the whole, it's all just too, um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a wuss, but. Riding a motorcycle scared the crap out of me. I did. I'm trying it. to find some of these. It's very things. freeing. There were well, some numbers that were pretty shocking in some of these papers. Well, and I don't want to distract you from finding the numbers because I definitely want to get into the data. Um, but we, we were starting to scratch the surface um, about some of the the types of injuries you would see from from motorcycles, like the the gentleman you mentioned that did end up passing away. Like he was wearing a helmet, right? Uh, so, yeah. Yep. So, so, I mean, any other type of, of injuries that you'd see related to motorcycles, fatal? Uh, fatal? I mean, me personally, no, not really. Or um, hear stories in the operating rooms. I don't know how much doctors not talk about that stuff. Really? Maybe, yeah. Those are, like, I bet, like, a general trauma surgeon probably has all kinds of fascinating motorcycle stories. <laughs> when you deal with such a small um, or, like, very specific patient population like i did you didn't really see stuff outside of the head or spine injuries okay although the wildest thing probably the one of the craziest things i ever saw was like this guy who was already in a wheelchair he was in a motorized wheelchair and literally got hit by a car crossing the highway on his motorized wheelchair the emt like literally i was like in the trauma bay when the emt comes in and literally is like this guy got hit and his whole motorized wheelchair flipped up over onto the top of the car. I'm just like, uh, I'm guessing he wasn't walking before the accident, or should I be a little more concerned that he's not moving his legs? They're like, oh, no, no, he's already paralyzed. I was like, all right, not much for me to do here. I can't fix paralysis. Well, I mean, was he, I have more questions, but like, was he, he was crossing the highway on a motorized scooter? <laughs> well, motorized wheelchair. He's already oh, yeah, in a wheelchair. He's That's already right. wheelchair Not scooter. Bound. He's like, like wh- why? Why was he Stephen crossing Hawking a highway? Like, What's why, that? Why was he crossing a highway on the scooter? Oh, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Like I that seems about guy, as dangerous I mean, as riding a motorcycle. The guy, I mean, this is like inner city Newark. The guy's like probably has some sort of psych uh, disease. Probably like homeless. I don't know how a homeless person gets a motorized wheelchair, but. I'm pretty sure this guy was homeless. Got it. All right. That makes a little yeah. more sense. I don't know where all these. I think there was something like motorcycle use increases risk of mortality by 30 to 40% or something like that. It was like a statistic I read in one of these papers. And I was like, that's pretty that's high. That's high. That's, that's high. Like just getting on a motorcycle, your risk of mortality. Do they break it down by like forty percent? Type of motorcycle. No, they're not. They that break specific. it down by like number. No, of these, no, these articles weren't that specific. Okay. Nor do they really care, right? They're looking at big aggregate databases right. that pretty much just their data points, like motorcycle with helmet, without helmet, is pretty much all they really see. 
still fascinating. Like that is a very high number. Like so, just getting on a bike, odds yeah. go up thirty percent. Something like that. Of you die. Try to confirm that that is true, and I didn't just make that up. But I'm pretty sure that was what I read. I don't remember. See, this is why I have to like write things down while I'm mm -hmm. reading these articles. I just sort of get fascinated at reading them, and I'm reading them more from like a like a personal interest. Like, you know, when you read the newspaper, you don't sit there and like write down interesting things. You're just like, oh, fascinating. But then when you're trying to recall it, you don't have it written down. Yeah. Um, but surely it must be in one of these papers. Was there any other interesting highlights from, from these papers? Um, um, One of them brought up a really interesting point about um, the possibility. So the possibility that in these, so you basically have two, apparently uh, at one point, like 48 out of 50 states had mandatory helmet laws. Mm -hmm. And then it was it the basically like to get to the point where we have significantly less states without mandatory helmet laws because a lot of those helmet laws were repealed. And I think it was once the data started coming out to suggest that possibly helmets were not life-saving. I mean, so, I'm assuming their perspective was like, well, why are we restricting people's uh, autonomy, right? Right. For something that's not even proven to make a difference. Even though it's one of those, like, it's kind of hard to like wrap your brain around the fact that like a helmet isn't going to increase your safety but i guess it does right it just doesn't affect mortality it doesn't mean that you don't get like, protection from other things right and i think it it'll definitely increase your safety but not significantly enough in the type of accidents that happen right yeah. like you're definitely safer with a helmet i think that goes but statistically yeah. like not enough to save your life which is is kind of wild and i don't disagree with you yeah so the one possible proposed like explanation for why the data may not be 100% accurate to reality is that um, the in the states where helmet laws are mandatory, there may still be just as many people desiring to ride a motorcycle without a helmet. And so they wear like non- uh credentialed or non like safety approved helmets so right. you know to avoid ticketing but then they still get into an accident and their you know likelihood of brain injury is still high because they're not wearing a dot or snell unapproved mm -hmm. uh helmet i was like i thought that was a little bit of a stretch but then again i don't know what people do it's like if you're gonna wear a helmet why would you wear like a fake helmet well, it's probably why cheaper would... probably like less cumbersome I mean, maybe it just looks really awesome. Um, I don't know. I mean, may, I feel like in today's you know, I don't know why age, it's so stuff. easy to get, you know, stuff manufactured yeah. all over the world. 3D or, print a helmet. You'll be fine. Get a pumpkin like uh, Charlie Brown. Yeah. Same difference, right? It's covering the head. Yeah. You're good. Just cut the stem off a pumpkin. Hollow it out. You'll be fine. Well, I did think it, one of the, the things that I... I noted in the, the study was it was conducted in California, Florida, and Texas, right? Like those are the states they were looking at, at least one of them. Yeah, Which, that's yeah, where they saw like, the most. Which makes sense because motorcycles are probably being ridden year round. Yeah. Um, so I'd be interested to see the, that opened up. But, you know, part of the reason I got rid of mine was, again, living in Chicago, I can ride my motorcycle for like three months. Yeah, like, that okay. was a big factor too. You know? Yeah. It was so the the riding season was so short in the Northeast. I bought my motorcycle when I lived in San Diego, and yeah. then I moved back to the Northeast, and like the appeal just wore off so fast. Yeah, like it, that's why it was fun, but then it became more of a burden, and I'm like, I'm paying for something that I have to put into winter storage for for most of the year here. Yeah. Like, all right, so yeah. On that note, nothing in today's episode and research convinced me to ever anytime soon want to get a new set of wheels i'm content in my metal cage pickup truck even even if i don't ever get another bike i do at least want to rent a bike and ride down the coast you know that's that's what i at least like I to mean, do. Sure. Scenic i've and been there done that i lived in, I on the coast in san diego i've ridden pacific highway mm -hmm. 
hundreds of times. I'm good. Been there, done it. You wouldn't make a road trip out there? Me and you just get on our bikes and ride? Cruise uh, the open roads? No, I'll drive down to Del Mar Beach, and uh, I'll be on the beach with a cooler and drinks whenever you get there. All right, perfect. That's good I'll, enough for I'll me. Take, you can take Pacific Coast Highway. I'll take the I-5. Perfect. In my no truck. idea. No and idea. I'll just be on the beach go. waiting for you with a cooler or drinks. Good enough for me. I have plenty of friends that I'm sure would be more than happy. Actually, I believe my one very good friend was like a diehard motorcycle rider. I'm pretty sure even once he had kids, I think he gave it up too. And it like it's blew my mind. Like the driving force. Yeah, I like blew my mind because I was like, I thought this is a guy that would ride a motorcycle for his, the rest of his life. He just loved it. You know, he's like born and raised in San Diego, like very like SoCal culture person. You know, riding a motorcycle is just life for him. And then I think he got rid of it. I mean, maybe he didn't. I don't know. I thought he at last I talked to him, he'd gotten rid of it. So I don't know. Crazy things. All right, any 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 closing thoughts for the audience, Josh? If you're gonna get a motorcycle, regardless of what the stats show you, if you're gonna get on one, yeah, just wear a wear a helmet. Just wear a helmet. Yeah. Be as safe as you possibly can be. You know what? I'll tell you what. You want to ride a motorcycle bit. without a helmet? Do it. You're gonna reap your own consequences. Stupid is stupid does. Okay. Well, all right. Let's take it. Let's take it back then. If you're thinking about getting on a motorcycle. Strongly consider all of the safety options available to you. Make your own decisions. Strongly Fair consider enough. that. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So before we close up for the night, don't forget, scan the QR code. Go to our new website. Donate to Brain and Spine Group, a nonprofit organization, to support our veteran programs, which are starting March 31st. Starting March 31st, veterans are going to be coming together for support for brain, spine, psychological injuries. Uh, brain and Spine Group is going to be working with them one-on-one -on -one to help veterans get access to the benefits they need, to the health care services that they need, to help answer their health care questions, uh, understand the medications that they're prescribed, whatever veterans need to better understand their health, we're providing it for them. Our meetings with veterans start March 31st. If you know a veteran, send them our way. Get them connected with our groups. We want to help them. Uh, if you want to support our programs financially, you can do it on our website. You can do it through our YouTube channel. You can do it anywhere you can find us on the internet. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can hit join on the community. Leave a little $4.99 monthly subscription that goes straight to helping our veteran programs. You can uh, go to the website and leave a direct donation. Everything's tax deductible. Everything we do is not for personal gain. It is for the betterment of the nonprofit organization Brain Spine Group. So before we go, don't forget, support Brandon Spine Group. And um, that, and otherwise, uh, meet us back next week for a pretty awesome episode with Reverend Jim Brooks talking about demon possession or psychiatric illness. Is demon possession real? I don't know. We'll see what the Reverend has to say. Otherwise, maybe it's just epilepsy. Maybe it's just psychiatric disease. I don't know. We'll see. And, we'll and see. that is... That is an episode I am very excited for, and what and I and I can't wait oh, yeah. to have the, the the support groups available to people. I think that is awesome. I know you'd mentioned one brief story. I would love if we could share like some stories, obviously non-specifics or um, just the success stories of of what people have to say about it. Once once that is up and running, but I'm I'm excited oh, that it's becoming. Well, a we are already helping veterans, right? Our first veteran got a. 30% increase on their disability rating. So if you want help getting increases in your disability rating, connect with us. Go to our website, find our veteran support pages, fill out the form so we have your contact information. We will get in contact with you. We will talk to you about how we can help you, and we're going to make it happen because that's what we do. You can get yeah, that's, reach out. I, I want to hear more things like that happening for people. You know, as this gets ramped up, like, I just want to, I want to keep hearing those stories because that's what this is all about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We got, we got more to come. So on that, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. We'll see you next week for our riveting discussion 
on demon possession versus psychiatric illness on epilepsy. It's going to be a good one. Don't miss it. Wednesday, next week, 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you.